Okay, welcome everyone to the uh, Friday Transportation Seminar. My name is Jennifer Dill. I'm a faculty member in Urban Studies and Planning. And along with my colleagues, Chris Monsier and Rob Bertini, we uh, co-organize uh, this weekly seminar. Welcome everyone. Before I introduce our uh, speaker, uh, a few reminders. We do webcast the seminar, and uh, which is why I have this microphone in front of me that is not projecting. That's so people on the web um, can hear what I'm saying. And when we get to the portion of today's seminar, where you can ask questions, we ask that you use the microphones that are on most of the desks, hold the touch button with the red light lit as you're asking the question. If you don't have one on your desk or if it's not working because some of them are out of order, uh, Chris Monsier is going to use this handy dandy portable mic to go around and try to um, make sure that our, the folks on the web can hear. And We do have regular people that watch live on the web and then the archived version. So it is important that the questions get recorded. So we appreciate that. Um, also remind people to turn off cell phones and Blackberries and those types of things. And um, I think those are all of my reminders. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Art Pierce. And um, he is with Portland's Office of Transportation. Perhaps more importantly, he's an alum of the Masters of Urban and Regional Planning Program here at PSU, one of our distinguished alumni. Um, and if any of you are thorough readers of The Oregonian, you found out more about Art this week, um, about um, his physical activity. Um, and he's giving up his uh, yoga class for today unfortunately, to be here with us to talk about um, an update on what's going on with the Portland Aerial Tram. So with that, I'm going to hand it over. All right. Great. Well, uh, I actually didn't bring as much of the engineering information, so I, I apologize to the civil engineering. We can talk more about it, but I don't have a lot of the slides talking about the actual construction work that we uh, went through to build the tram. So this is more of sort of moving on into now that the tram is uh, up and running. Um, so a um, little bit of background about me. Uh, so I did graduate in 2000 from the um, Master of Urban Regional Planning program uh, at PSU um, and have worked for the Office of Transportation now for nearly 10 years um, on various transit corridor projects mostly and in the last five years or so down in South Waterfront and then on the Portland Aerial Tram. Um, so the topic today, uh, I was going to be talking about uh, the Portland Aerial Tram and sort of the broader context uh, context of how infrastructure investment can shape how people understand the world around them, how it changes what they believe is possible in terms of how they get around, um, and really, you know, sort of changing the landscape around ev uh, everyone. Um, so to start out with, uh, we just a couple weeks ago, a, uh, a documentary uh, filmmaker, uh, Tom Frisch, local guy, uh, put out a video that of, of the tram, sort of a tram story. Um, so I thought I might start with that. It's a, a couple, 15 minutes long or so, um, but I think it does kind of frame the story well and shows a lot of nice imagery of the tram, um, and then I can follow on with that with a little bit more uh, detailed discussion. The situation that gave rise to this tram in Portland um, brought together a really series of unique cases. We had a, a very large employer, a very large density of employees up on a congested hillside that had a lot of latent transportation demand and really needed a, an inventive way to connect to it. When OHSU was looking at alternatives for where to grow their campus, they were very, very seriously considering expanding their campus out um, in the suburbs. And from the city's perspective, 
losing those continued jobs out to the suburbs is, of course, uh, an issue in terms of tax base, and even more so an issue in terms of transportation systems. The idea that was mentioned to us was being a train. could choose to get around, but this was the first time when there was enough energy behind it and enough funding behind it to, uh, to make that you know, a reality. So the tram's a connection. At its basic element, it is a quick way of connecting between two disparate points. The whole tram project was unique in that the city decided to do a design competition so rather than going directly to the tram supplier and saying, build us a generic tram, uh, we decided that we wanted to make this a world-class tram. What if we treat the tram the same way we would treat a bridge? If they have a beginning and the end and in the middle, and every moment of that experience ought to be something special. The overall guiding principles were um, the upper station would be of the air and the lower station would be of the earth. In the end, we hired uh, AGPS Architecture out of Los Angeles to do the design for the project. And one of their sort of major organizing concepts was making the tram go away, making it invisible as best as possible. So they envisioned a soap bubble in the sky as their inspiration for what the tram car would be like. It was handed over to Gangloff Cabins, which is the tram equipment supplier. The uh, design challenge for them was to take the standard rectangle framing that they would build a typical tram car out of and figure out a way to give it an outer shell that would, that would match that shape that was designed by the architect. Basically what happened is they brought you know, two guys out of retirement who had you know, done uh, custom cars for Bugatti. But there's you know, pictures of these guys you know, hammering this thing out. And if you look really closely, it's beautiful and you know, very smooth, but there is this sense of it being handmade. You know? And it's just a very subtle thing. You know, there's just a slight you know, difference to it that I think really makes it quite uh, uh, enchanting. There's three-dimensional bends in all the glass, so similar to the uh, front windshield of an automobile. It's very hard to bend glass in that way, and it takes a very specialized glass supplier. Right on the, the border between uh, Switzerland and France, there's a glass manufacturer who makes a lot of front windshields for ocean-going ships, things like that. And so they took on the challenge of, of bending the glass in this shape, and then also um, including these, these different films in, in the center of the glass in order to give it a tint and to give it the outer mirror finish that helps it blend in. If you compare it to you know, the tram cars, you know, they exist elsewhere in the world. It's really quite elegant and, you know, interesting. The tram tower's design was intended to be iconic, to be a, a visible image as you approach into downtown. So it really was designed to, um, to stand out on its own. It was going to be so prominent that it had to have a lovely uh, look to it. It had to be a piece of sculpture. The challenge was to build a device that has to be designed to very, very high tolerances. The uh, ability of, of the tower to move is nil. Our tower is about 200 feet tall. It's constructed out of steel plates that have uh, gusseted steel behind it, and then the outer edges of it are filled with concrete. The tram tower actually leans a little bit down the hill, so it's, it's essentially trying to bisect the two angles of the ropes so that it's taking those stresses and matching them directly down into the earth. One of the greatest challenges of building the tram tower is that we had a three inch by three inch uh, box essentially up in the sky that we needed to have the top of the tower line up with. So if you picture uh, each segment of the tram tower as we put it up into place, it's going to settle a little bit under its own weight. As we added the concrete, it would settle again 
uh, into a new location. So on each of those steps, we were surveying and adjusting the design of the tram tower in order to make it match up in that location. It ended up being within an inch and a half of the overall design location, so we were quite excited that that worked well. The upper station was the most challenging element of the project. Both in its location and the, um, the surrounding area around it made it very, very hard to design and construct. The engineering challenges were extreme. Most trams anchor into a hillside, into bedrock, and uh, this one anchors into a tower that's, I forget how many feet now, 170 feet up in the air. Basically, it's a, it, you know, it's a question of torque, and the cables and cars all together, you know, weigh like a million pounds, you know, it's what, 3,300 feet of cables, and, and, you know, there's several cables, and the cables are like this big, and they're heavy as you know, all get out. And when you add that up, it's a million pounds, you know, that's hanging there. The simple solution would have been to attach the tram directly to the, the hospital that was being built at the upper end of the tram and use that as an anchor, because that certainly would have been stable. It was already under construction. There was a concern about vibration. There's nothing that equals this. This is, you know, uh, completely unique in the history of engineering. They had a goal of keeping it very light in terms of its, you know, look and feel. And so they came up with this, you know, sort of cross-legged scheme. As, you know, challenging as it was as an engineering, you know, feat, um, I, I think that it is actually pretty beautifully designed. It's very minimal use of color in it is just incredibly thoughtful and, and unusual. It's just looking at it as a, you know, as a minimalist sculpture. One of the things that has been most striking already in just one year of operation is the number of cyclists that are using the tram. If you picture uh, biking from anywhere in the city up to OHSU, you're navigating very, very busy streets, not all of them with bike lanes, and having to cycle up to 500 feet um, uphill. The South Waterfront District is connected by a series of trails to um, all throughout the region, really. Um, as well as a number of streets that have good bike lanes on them. So we're seeing uh, 300 plus cyclists per day are bringing their bikes actually on the tram cars, and about that many are um, parking in the, uh, the facilities at the base of the tram. Day in, day out, the tram runs off of electric power. So very, very inexpensive to uh, power the system and very, very efficient. In some cases, when there's a full cabin coming down the hill and an empty cabin going up the hill, there's portions along the alignment where the tram system is actually generating electricity. One of the responsibilities of bridges is to recognize what's special about that which they pass over. This is passing over a neighborhood. And it, I think it's a very special neighborhood in a positive way, but it's also very special in a very negative way. It has suffered the imposition of transportation infrastructure being laid on top of it more often and with greater impact than any other neighborhood in the city of Portland in the last century. The responsibility for the tram as it passed over those neighborhoods was to develop a very careful, sensitive relationship with the neighborhoods below. To say that it had no impact uh, would be wrong. Well, the neighborhood wanted to get something out of the construction of the tram, and they will get a bridge where they can get from the neighborhood down to the waterfront. So that was the positive aspect. The political backlash was that we did anger neighbors in the Southwest Hills, and uh, I'm not sure there was anything other than promising them the ability uh, for them to enjoy the waterfront and the use of the waterfront and purchasing their homes uh, if, if they were down the alignment. There wasn't very much else we could do.
over time as the sores of the people who live you know underneath it are sort of salved and they move on and whatnot I think that it will you know be equally embraced by the neighborhood and essentially being you know thankful that they took this route as opposed to you know having buses going up and down the hill the tram creates a new link in uh, a series of networks of both roads and, and transit systems uh, where the tram is unique is that it's able to fly above the, the roadways. When the Greenway is in place and, and all of the connections that the tram was meant to be just one part of, that will be essentially our 21st century Spanish steps. It was a challenging project. I early on didn't quite believe that it could be done. Uh, it was very controversial. We did blow it on the costs element. And there's a story there that hasn't really been told about uh, what happened and who was responsible for that. And quite frankly, I don't want to replay any of that because I think we have to constantly look to the future uh, and what it will mean for Portland. And it will mean uh, an important place on the city map and hopefully a place that will create the jobs that we had planned for 12 years ago. And there's a thousand people working in that building at the other end. Um, you know, the Center for Health and Healing, and it's just a bus going back and forth all day. I mean, it's you know, incredibly crowded. It has made one community out of the top of the hill and the bottom of the hill and the west side of the river. I viewed my mission as mayor to build the city physically as well as socially and economically, and this is one physical build that I'm proud of, and I think the city's going to be very proud of it, and all of the arguments are going to be forgotten ten years from now. When you come around, you know, the corner of the Terwilliger Curves, and South Waterfront emerges kind of like this strange emerald city, the tram and the tower rising right next to the freeway. There's something that really says, oh, I've arrived in a place that's very different. When you look around the world and you look at, at how cities are growing, you know, in this, in this phase of humanity, it's up, not out. And this is our version of it. I've never actually tried to follow this before, so I'm going to try not to repeat myself too much. Um, so obviously this, that gives a good backdrop of the project, um, really from more of its, uh, the aesthetics and the design side. So I guess for the civil engineering students, they've got a little bit of the information about the challenge of the design of it. Um, what I've found most interesting sort of after the, the dust has cleared for the tram project is how it changes the way that people see the landscape around them. You know, each piece of new infrastructure, be it a new freeway exchange, a new uh, transit investment, changes what individual people think of the area around them. It, it really is a shift in how they understand how to get around um, and in how, how they want to live their daily lives. And so that's kind of what I want to talk about a little bit more today is some of the initial findings of that and some of the interest, interesting conclusions that I, um, I'm already coming to, and we can talk more about that. Um, so when it, we think about transportation infrastructure, there is, there is this overlay to um, how best to design a, a project to break down barriers. And sometimes that is the barrier is you're not able to drive from one point to the other. Um, in an urban environment such as downtown Portland, really you're trying to find ways for people to be able to get around freely and easily without having to hop in a car, 
leave one parking space and head into another. Um, and so in this case, that is um, one of the things that the tram really does a very good job at as really changing how people see these two disparate locations and how they see them as connected. Um, and also as they see this is a new way to access OHSU. Now South Waterfront is a door to OHSU's campus, which is very, very different than how people thought of OHSU before. Um, particularly as it's projected to, to grow, that's really going to continue to change. Um, so just stepping back a little bit from um, what we already talked about in the movie. Um, so you know, everyone knows where South Waterfront is if you live in, in, in Portland. Uh, but for a very, very long time, this was this you know, area very close to downtown, centrally you know, located, but is this little island cut off by these various freeway interchanges um, and, and separated by the river from access on the other point. Um, that of, of an industrial and unused land. And so this is it's, uh, an area that for a very, very long time, the cities wanted to find a way to catalyze some change down there. Um, so it had this sort of deep history as a timber and, and ship building and dismantling uh, area. Um, and is now, you know, or was really not that long ago, the late, the late 90s, early 2000s, um, was this area that, that uh, we wanted to find a way to, to really find some, some new change in that area. Um, so one of the, from the planning perspective, kind of the overarching goals perspective, the South Waterfront District was visioned as part of a downtown science and technology quarter, the, a location where all these various institutions could connect and do work that, work, that uh, works together and builds on each other's efforts. Um, and overall, the district is envisioned to, um, just in the central area, have 5,000 jobs and 2,700 housing units, and at build-out, have as many as 10,000 jobs and 5,000 housing units. So really, it's own little city adjacent to downtown Portland. Um, and I think one of the key things that we tried to reiterate again and again as we're trying, talking about how to plan the district was that this is an urban district. This is part of downtown, and this needs to be an area where people think of it and think about how they get around and, and the types of lives that they're lead, leading as an area that you're in part of downtown. That if you're in downtown and you're going to go to another portion of downtown, um, you know, living and working all in downtown, it isn't a very you know, conceptually strong choice to say that I need to pay for a parking space where I live and pay for another parking space where I work, and this is how I'm going to get around. So we wanted people in South Waterfront to really understand that this is an area in which they're going to be having to embrace urban living to enjoy living down in this area. Um, you know, with the freeways all around the South Waterfront district, it is an area that has tremendous access you know, at midnight, but at 5 p.m. or 8 a.m., it's surrounded by congested freeways. That's not the best way to get in and out of that district. Um, so generally, I won't go into the details of the district's vision as much here, but it is envisioned to be a mixed-use urban district. Um, I think it is important to understand the degree of partnership that it took to, to make the, uh, the district happen. It's, kind of, it's a portion of the tram story that isn't very well understood. Um, you know, so it, in order for this, all these pieces to come together, this took a partnership between OHSU and the City of Portland and, and these uh, development partners to bring enough energy and enough commitment down into that district that each of those parties was willing to put that level of investment in. Um, and I think um, certainly at the city we're very aware of it, but I think even in private development they're very aware of the fact that you, you, no one can do it alone. Private, you know, private entities don't have enough money themselves to, to build all the infrastructure they need to support the development they want, and nor does the city have enough to be able to just simply on its own throw infrastructure out there without a commitment from private parties. Um, and so this is, I think, South Waterfront's a great example of the type of agreement that needs to occur in order to, to make development occur. Um, so sort of the, the broader money picture behind, so there's... Uh, $440 million in private investment that's already gone into the district, uh, $122 million in public projects, $70 million of that being um, actual public money, $52 million of that being private sources into public projects. Um, so a fair amount of money and a fair amount of leverage. If you picture $70 million and getting $440 million back, that's a pretty good investment by anyone's standards. Um, so certainly that is the model I think that the city should be using in terms of how to produce new growth is to, to um, you know, use its investment to catalyze further private support. Uh, so the city's commitment was to build transportation infrastructure. That's what the city committed to do, um, and some parks infrastructure. Uh, establishing a street grid down in the, in the district and adding a series of transit links to downtown and up to OHSU, so the streetcar, bus, uh, and, and the tram. 
um, as well as uh, greenway connections, bike and uh, pedestrian connections. Uh, so the greenway is, is, is in the future going to be a, a really strong component of the district. It is, it is not come to fruition yet, but is definitely in motion, um, and there's new money behind that as well. So that's uh, 150 foot uh, greenway along the whole portion of the district really will make it a very special place similar to the waterfront park. Um, so what does this have to do with the tram? So um, OHSU back in the mid-90s was looking at what they should do uh, to expand their campus. Um, they have built themselves into this hillside that you see uh, pictured on the left um, and needed to find a, a way to, to, to uh, continue to expand, wanted to do so within the city, but also um, had a lot of land out at the, the Oregon Graduate Institute campus out in the suburbs and was considering whether they should do their future expansion out there. Um, from the city's perspective, we definitely want to support um, investment in the central city um, from an investment standpoint, but also from the transportation standpoint. If you picture um, adding that number of trips between the OHSU campus and some sub suburban campus, you're, you're putting that much extra stress on the Sunset Corridor. Um, so it's very important for the city to try to continue to emphasize the growth um, in, in the core um, where we have the transit infrastructure to support it. Um, so the question was how to make that link. The OHSU needed something that could be fast and reliable. Um, simply saying you can run a shuttle bus back and forth is true, but at times it'll take you 15 minutes and another time it'll take you half an hour. If you're somebody who's needing to have meetings at either end, that's not a reliable link. You're caught up in the fray of the regional tra uh, transportation coming back and forth through the middle there. Um, and so really that's where it, the discussion was pushed towards um, finding a way to um, kind of get above all that, and so that's where the, the tram and gondola systems kind of rose uh, above the, all, all the other options as a way of, of very, very quickly connecting three-minute ride back and forth uh, between the two locations. Um, trams particularly are, are, make sense when there's a lot of barriers. So in this case, we have um, all the freeways cutting through. We have the Twilliger um, Parkway area. So any on the surface um, area, uh, any on the surface solutions are going to have a lot of impact to there and to the neighborhoods below. If you picture uh, funicular, that's essentially one long bridge going along all the way through the neighborhood. Um, the degree of impact that that would be sort of building upon the impacts already happening in that neighborhood um, would, would would not work. It's, it's just simply not a solution. Um, so the tram, in terms of capacity, uh, carry 900 plus people uh, in, per hour uh, per direction. Um, it'd be much harder for any other option to compete with that level of capacity. Um, it does take only three minutes. Um, and believe it or not, the tram was, was strongly driven by that um, the livability question. Um, a tram is able to, to span long distances without any on the ground supports. So we have 3,000 feet between the tower and the upper station that we're able to uh, span with the, the tram wires um, without any impact on the neighborhood below physically. There's still the shadow and the, and the movement above, but there's no physical on the ground impacts where a gondola system would have had a series of towers all along the street. Um, and trams also work uh, very well, very simply in terms of maintenance. So the very reliable systems have less uh, moving parts than other types of ropeway systems. Uh, so that combined with uh, streetcar connection, uh, starts to, to really create some synergy between OHSU, downtown, PSU, uh, and the South Waterfront District. Uh, so everyone always, uh, no tram show is uh, complete without a little discussion of budget. Um, so it's true that the initial estimate uh, that was given when you asked a couple tram uh, experts how much it costs to build a tram that's this long and goes this high, they said, oh, you know, maybe 15 million. Um, and so that's the number that everyone remembers. The first budget that was actually produced you know, based on architectural drawings was about $28.5 million. Um, and then at the next tier up, um, as we started getting bids in, the, the price continued to rise uh, to 40 and $57 million. Um, I think an important thing to note, and I'm not going to go into the details of sort of theories of why the tram got caught in the middle of all that uh, inflation, but uh, OHSU uh, throughout the process remained committed to seeing this project through as part of that broader, de broader development agreement um, and continued to raise its contribution, um, all told contributing 71% of the overall budget. Uh, that's extremely rare for a private uh, entity to subsidize a public transportation link to that degree. It is primarily serving them, 
Um, and this does match, the city's contribution matches the level of public use that's anticipated, about 15%. Um, but it is, it is definitely uh, a very rare instance where we get this level of subsidy from a private institution. Um, so the thing that I've found really n noteworthy um, is uh, making the bicycle connection. Um, so that's what I'd like to focus a little bit more on today. Um, check on how we're doing on time. Okay. Uh, so one of the things that's, that is interesting, and we knew it as we were building the tram, but did, I don't think it really sunk in until we opened it, is that the tram is connected at, through South Waterfront to a whole series of, of off-street trail networks um, all throughout the city. Uh, so it really uh, is changing uh, the types of connections that people can, can make happen, um, how to connect up to OHSU. Uh, and so we did anticipate that. We did build bike facilities at the, at the tram lower station, so there's some spaces on the um, on the, the plaza area right behind the tram station, and then there's also um, lockers and underground parking um, within OHSU's new building for their uh, employees. Uh, and so and OHSU has their, their uh, bike commuter punch card system where they uh, help uh, reimburse uh, the, their cyclists similar to someone would receive a transit subsidy if they were getting a transit pass. Um, so the, the, the groundwork was definitely being set for this. Um, also, OHSU uh, has a wellness center at the bottom that, is, that can work for commuters to use that location as a shower facility before they get on the tram uh, to head up to work up at OHSU. Um, so in terms of once we opened the tram, where, where, where did we end up? Uh, we had projected 1,500 to 3,000 riders per day in the first year, uh, and what we're actually experiencing is much higher than that, 4,000 to 4,500 uh, riders per day. Um, that's overall, that's about 10% of capacity. So we that we're still um, have a lot of excess capacity within the tram system that can continue to support um, the South Waterfront District as it grows. Um, at peak hours, we are seeing about 25 to 30% of capacity being used up. So there are moments in which the tram system is quite busy. Um, and of that, there's about 14, 15% is uh, public riders, either those that are using it as a transit link per day or uh, especially in the summer, there was a, a fair amount of tourism use, uh, people using it as a sightseeing trip. Uh, one of the things that has been interesting, OHSU employee usage has been, has been much higher than expected, but that uh, patient and visitor usage has been less. So I think until the campus starts to develop more at the bottom, and, there tends, and it tends to be a use between the two sections of the campus more, um, we're, we're still seeing less students using it than we had anticipated. Um, all told, about a million, uh, three, in overall riders uh, since we opened about just about a year ago. Uh, so first summer out there, what happened? Uh, we were overwhelmed with bikes. It was, it was, uh, there was a standing joke amongst folks that if you stood in one spot for too long, uh, someone would come up and try to wrap a U-lock around your leg and hitch up to you. It was, there was no place to put your bikes. Um, so it was definitely, we had no idea that there was going to be that degree of latent demand to get up to OHSU by bicycle. Um, though, as, like, as I mentioned in the movie, or as I mentioned a little earlier, um, if you picture, uh, certainly dressed as I am today, and I'm downtown, and I'm trying to choose which way to go do I, to get up to OHSU. Do I ride up the hill, or do I ride down to South Waterfront and take the tram? Um, certainly, for me, there's only one answer if I didn't want to come, you know, come into the meeting all covered in sweat. So it, it definitely makes a lot of sense just in terms of, of ease of access to get up to the, to the OHSU area. Uh, so we're seeing uh, two to 300 bikes overall parked at the tram lower station uh, in the summer again. It's less busy now, of course. Um, and about 200 bikes um, on being brought on the cabins each day. Uh, so OHSU, for their bike commute challenge, uh, reported a participation increase of 257% uh, from the previous year. Um, there probably are a number of factors, but certainly one of them has to be that there's this new connection for how to get up to the campus. Um, so we uh, started putting in more temporary racks along the street um, and found those to get filled up as well. So we definitely um, have, have a long-term issue of finding um, a way of meeting all this demand and really supporting this demand um, with more end-of-trip facilities, more, more uh, parking facilities down at the bottom. Um, so the city's bicycle counts also shows some interesting data related to um, how the tram has impacted trips. Um, so bicycle tr counts down um, right at, in South Waterfront at Gibbs and Moody, uh, increased 135%. Um, and one of the things that's interesting is that 50% of the cyclists heading by that location are women, at this, um, where overall, citywide, 30% are typically women. So there's something 
different either about OHSU or about the types of barriers that were keeping people from getting down to uh, getting to OHSU um, that have enabled uh, a larger proportion of women to uh, now use this location. So I think that's also interesting just in terms of when we think about how uh, barriers influence different genders differently, per perhaps, that there's, there's definitely something to this story that we haven't quite um, fully figured out uh, related to that and how the tram has fit in. Um, so there, there was some trip direction change. So some people that were before riding up Sam Jackson or Terwilliger have now redirected their trips to use the tram to get up and down the hill. Uh, but there's definitely overall a large growth um, despite that decline on the other route. Uh, also pretty interesting, down in the Center for Health and Healing, OHSU's new building, um, they're reporting a 41% uh, transit and walk bike uh, mode split. So that's quite high um, for a, the first building in a, in a district that's developing. That's what we might expect as the district really starts to get going. So uh, certainly we're already finding that this, this first building is, is acting as though it's in a very urban dense place even before it's surrounded by all the rest of the buildings. So I think that's also pretty interesting that certainly through whatever systems OHSU has running, they um, are able to still um, achieve such a high mode split. Um, so, you know, the conclusions I'm reaching is that, you know, the tram was able to cut through some barriers that were keeping people from using alternative modes uh, to get a route in their daily life. Um, and I think it is interesting to think about um, what, how infrastructure can build on other infrastructure to then, um, you know, allow people to utilize a whole network that is already there for them um, just by creating one additional link. Uh, so a whole slew of, of uh, results. So there's this, uh, you know, the money results. We've out of 70 million of public investment, there's 440 million in private investment. Um, seeing expansion down in the district, starting to get going. Some new housing development, um, and this new plan for OHSU's expansion down in South Waterfront, uh, which of course has this very recent cloud of what does the tort uh, liability claim do to their ability to continue to expand, whether or not they need to change how aggressively in the pace at which they are ready to expand. Um, and I, I don't think we know the end of that story uh, yet at all. Um, and then I think one of the other important points is that once as a region or as a city you start to uh, emphasize an area, start to invest in an area, it's not, it's not a one-time investment. We have now committed to the expansion of South Waterfront as a region and there's going to be additional investment over time to continue to support the transportation needs uh, and other infrastructure needs for that area. Um, so there's the need for this district to um, have just portal connections out to the areas around it, to have additional transit connections. Um, and then also it's you know, bounded by some of the most congested regional freeways um, in, you know, in this whole area. And so certainly over time we are going to need to see some improvements to the regional freeway system to continue to meet South Waterfront's needs, the Central City's needs, really the, the, the needs of, of a lot of the driving public um, as well. So it's it definitely, um, the story is not over yet. Um, so I guess the, the question I'll leave with, and then we can start uh, a more active discussion. Um, you know, was this a good investment? Um, you know, the city put some money out there to supporting the, the uh, growth of this district. Um, you know, was this a good choice for the city to make to, to try to emphasize this area and get this area uh, redeveloping? Um, and then, of course, how do we measure whether or not it was successful? Um, at this point now, if, if the district stopped growing, we probably didn't make a good investment. This, but I, I don't think it's expected that this is the end of the story yet. Um, but So I think over time, as we see the district develop and see how it develops, we'll understand better whether or not the types of investments we made created the type of place that we were hoping to, to see happen. So I'd uh, be happy to take uh, questions and comments, uh, either all the way back to things that were in the video or things that I was talking about. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll take it from there. Yeah, go ahead. Oh. Use the aerial tram considered a safe facility? Has uh, there been any accidents, problems in it? There, uh, there have not been any accidents. Uh, we have had some periods of, of high winds where we have shut down. Uh, so with 50 miles an hour of wind going north-south across the tramway, that will create enough swing that at times we need to shut down. So we've shut down for some, you know, a couple hour periods and run a shuttle bus during that period to get people back to the location they were, they were starting from. Um, but we haven't experienced any other, um, any other issues so far. Um, we have, there's, there's been other shutdowns to do maintenance activity. Um, but yeah, to, to date, um, 
Um, it's worked very well. I think one of the things that's interesting is that the tram, a tram is typically built for a mountain environment. It's, it's built to withstand um, pretty harsh environments. And so we've actually surprisingly been able to produce that down here at times of snowstorms and heavy winds. But it's really made to be able to uh, take on that level of, of uh, sort of environmental hits. So, yeah. yeah, in the back. On the other hand, though, I have a friend who uses it for her commute, and I understand from her that in hot weather there's absolutely no vent or window that opens. Is anything being done to address Right, so that? we did install some additional vents uh, last summer uh, to bring additional air in. Um, and one of the things that is being discussed for in preparation for next summer is whether we do need to put in some additional um, openings into the tram system. Um, we don't have the ability to do air conditioning because it's, it's powered by a low voltage battery system when it's flying back and forth. Um, and so we are happy to rely on, on just the, the movement of air. Um, so I, I think um, it will be, a, or continue even with operable windows, to be warm on a warm day. It's not going to be colder than it is outside. Yeah. I guess I'm curious about why there wasn't anything opening. Was it once again the thought that it was, they are often designed for mountain environments where you don't want to open the windows or? You know, one of the, the large challenges was the unique design of the tram cabin. So these curved windows and the curved shape of the tram didn't make it for an easy location to just have a window that can slide down. Um, and so some of it was based on the design of wanting this uniform bubble. Um, it didn't, didn't give us a lot of locations where that's possible. Um, I think the other was they, the original design did have a series of fans above the doors, and the de designers believed that that would be adequate to move air through enough. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, you stated the need for OHSU to build the, the campus was the constrained campus and the heavy traffic. Um, and you touched on... Um, you know, making making it more available to bicyclists. Right. Um, has there been any any discussion or um, to put in a parking structure? Because I know the parking structure on on the campus is already congested, and that was part of the impetus to right to right. build the tram. There's there's some policy because of the way that the South Waterfront's envisioned to be such an urban location. Um, there's concern about creating it as a park and ride for, for the OHSU area. So there is already some parking that's down there to serve just the building, um, but there isn't at this point uh, a plan to create a, a park and ride down in South Waterfront. Um, what the plan really is is that this is a location that we can emphasize a lot of regional transit towards. So the addition of light rail, the addition of, of streetcar to Lake Oswego is the type of investment the city can make to bring more and more trips to the base of the tram. Um, and so the hope is over time that that's the way that people, um, other than cycling to it, are able to access it without using a car. Yeah? I'm wondering uh, how much expenditure on the maintenance and, uh, and uh, who paid it? Paid oh, sure. it? Yeah. Um, so the, the tram has an operating budget of $1.7 million per year. Um, and so that covers the, the, the cost for running the system paying Doppelmeyer staff to, who actually run it as well as the maintenance of the buildings. Um, and so 85% of that cost is covered by OHSU. And then the city, in order to cover the cost for its share of the operating, uh, chose a fare of $4 as, as for each individual rider um, to cover the, the, the city's share of the, of the operating cost. Anyone who wants to utilize it with a, as a daily transit user and has a TriMet bus pass uh, monthly or yearly is able to access it for free. So it's really just the daily rider that, that pays. So it's, it's really getting at the more of the tourist rider, the sightseeing rider, than the transit dependent <laughs> rider. Um, so uh, you know, it, I think it's a very good question. It's something we really struggled with just as we were getting ready to open. The initial assumption was that, that it would be seamless with TriMet's system way back in the early planning process. Um, but given the cost inflation of the capital side of the project, there was concern about asking the city through whatever source to subsidize the, the tram every year. And so the, the belief was that if we were to, able to charge a, for, a, a fare that could cover um, the tram's own costs, that that was the, the most sort of equitable way that the city could run the system. Um, so it was, it was a, you know, a, a struggle, certainly, and a political one at that, um, of trying to discuss how the, how the tram should fit into the rest of the transportation system. Um, at least for now, the solution is, uh, really, the paying fares are what cover the, the city's cost. There's yeah. actually, oh. I'm sorry to interrupt, but we have a related question. Oh, that, that oh okay, sure. About operating costs, but also, are you able to compare the operating costs of the tram to other modes of transit, like a cost per trip, or cost per mile, or something like that? Because I know that's something that's 
the revenue mile service or anything like that? Um, not off the top of my head. Um, well, let's see, if we have 1.7 million in cost per year and, and 1.3 million riders per year, I don't have, I don't have, I, I can't do that math in my head, but that at least could give you a, a very, very rough figure. Um, <laughs> how much is it? About yeah, about a dollar. Okay, yeah, right. Um, um, and but I think what's unique about it is that it is, you know, it's primarily uh, a, a uh, an elevator, getting between two sections of OHSU's campus. I mean, that's really the impetus behind building this was making a connection for OHSU. It serves the public transportation purpose as well, but really the initial drive for why the, we, we built this was to allow OHSU to, to have a seamless connection. People who work up at the top of OHSU's campus discuss that they're able to get to the bottom for a meeting more quickly than they can walking to the nursing school that's up on the same campus. So, the, so really the tram has made it a, a faster connection than them getting just within in, internal campus circulation. Uh, are there any other case studies that are similar to that one, or th is this one unique in Portland? This is pretty unique. Um, Roosevelt Island <laughs> built a tram uh, just connecting to Manhattan uh, in the 70s. So that's the one other example that we have of a uh, use of a tram in America for uh, urban transportation. There's examples uh, internationally uh, where that's occurred. Um, but n not necessarily this urban. I think that uh, most of them internationally are connecting an upper village with a lower city um, going through a less developed area. I think this is a very unique case uh, where we're, we're placing something in such an urban environment. I have another question. Yes, sure. um, in the video, I've seen the tower. It's not cylindrical, neither it's rectangular. I mean, it has different shapes. She, she even said it's like a piece of sculpture. Right. So does this have uh, to do something with the structures, or is it just a piece of art? Or, I mean, it's just you know, there was a, different. I, th I think that's a very good question. There was uh, a constant <laughs> discussion between the architects and the structural engineering uh, company, Arup, um, about how to create a beautiful structure that is you know, minimal, but also can withstand the forces it needs to withstand. Um, so there was a period in which it was a, a single uh, wooden pole with these different guy lines holding in place at the very beginning. It also became a series of wooden poles sort of interlaced like a teepee with it coming over the top. So there was various different uh, conceptual ideas that then had to go through the engineering side about whether or not it's feasible. And so I think this is a, is a sort of a match, a marriage between those two of they were able to find a shape that they found you know, compelling and then a structural way of supporting that shape um, through all those gusseted plates that we saw in the video um, as well as the, the, the concrete port and the outside edges to make it stiff enough. It has to be very, very stiff. So it's a, a building of that size would move much more than the tower does. Yeah? yeah? Um, were there any uh, problems with the uh, privacy issues with the existing neighborhood? Definitely. This, this, we spent a lot of time trying to work out the best solution um, and really came out with a compromise that I don't think either necessarily meets the the, the rider's best needs or the neighbor's best needs. Um, so neighbors were very concerned about um, people looking down and onto their houses below. And so we um, had looked at um, various versions of laminated films that would allow you to look forward but not down or you know, to side to side, um, as, well, as well as actual physical louvers in the cabin um, and determined that neither of those really uh, functioned very well. We had mock-ups made of them um, and put into the cabin so we could see what they would look like. Um, while it was still in design and construction in sort of the early phases. Um, and so the laminated films, because of the three-dimensional glass, fogged in really weird places and, and folded over itself. Um, so it made you feel kind of queasy, to be honest. Um, <laughs> uh, and then the, the uh, louvers, the concern was, was weight as well as if you had to do an emergency stop and you, you would be pushing someone against a, a, a grill, essentially. Um, and so didn't feel that that was a, a, a good solution either. So what we ended up doing is taking the height of the, the chin of the average wheelchair user based on ADA guidelines and made that the height of the, uh, of the frosting of the glass. So we're able to provide a degree of privacy but still allow um, people of all different abilities to still be able to um, have a view from the tram cabin. Um, so d definitely a compromise. Um, we did, I did give the first preview ride to folks that live right below the tram so they could um, hear from me straight on that we did as best we could and weren't able to necessarily get it all you know, exactly as they had hoped. Um, and so I, I haven't talked to a lot of neighbors in recent times about how they've been experiencing the, the privacy concern, 
Um, but certainly from the noise side, the tram has been, I think, uh, less noisy than I expected. So I think that's been, been a good. We actually have another a web question that sure. relates to this, and that was a uh, number of residents of Larry Hill Soft have complaints about the tram going over the neighborhood since it's been in operation. And other than the pedestrian path to South Waterfront, are there any other improvements still to be implemented? And I actually related to that. Is there supposed to be a bridge built? And there is, yeah. So, um, so in terms of the softening, um, yes, I think to a degree. And, and um, I don't know if I have enough context to know whether that is just the passage of time and, or that people were unable to, to uh, visualize what it looked like and it's not as bad as they thought. But I, you know, there definitely has been um, a softening to a degree. There's some people who are still clearly very upset about the fact that the tram went in. And I don't think it's necessarily surprising. If you lived in a neighborhood anywhere for a very long time, you could picture a, a new house being built next, next door or a new busier road down the street, but you wouldn't picture that there'd be a, a flying object coming over the street in front of you. Um, so I mean, I, I think it's very logical that someone would find this you know, a hard thing to adjust to. Um, so in terms of improvements, uh, the pedestrian bridge is, a, um, is in design right now and will be go on construction, I believe, next year. Um, so that is underway, fully funded. We got federal funding for that. Uh, that'll connect between uh, Kelly Street, essentially, and then down to South Waterfront at the base of the tram. Um, we also are doing some traffic calming that'll go on construction this summer along Corbett Avenue, which is right along the main corridor beneath the tram. Um, and then there's sort of long-term discussions about what to do with the Ross Island Bridgehead and a lot of those connections. So there's a lot of, uh, still a lot of neighborhood energy behind finding a, a more elegant solution to how to connect these different regional uh, locations. Yeah, Daniel. Um, I was just wondering, um, isn't OHSU building in Hillsboro? Or uh, there's, are they planning a campus out there anyway? Um, I, you know, I don't know the details of it. I, I, they do have some facilities that are still out in the suburban location. What they've um, what we've been in discussions with them is moving their academic functions down to uh, South Waterfront. So they may still have some satellite facilities out in the suburbs, but definitely what they're discussing and what the, their, their sort of conceptual plans are showing is the moving of a lot of those academic functions all down to South Waterfront. So, yeah. yeah. Little off, little off topic, but you did mention it right. um, <clears throat> in the Lair Hill area and that Corbett area and, and down in that area. One of the things I've noticed, and because I have a distinctly uh, separate perspective than most people, is the ADA capabilities of the sidewalks and such in that area are right. severely out of date. Um, is there any talk of improving uh, or adding that to some of the, you know, when the bridge goes in and such? Is there Definitely. any talk of adding that? To yeah, so actually on two fronts, uh, the Corbett traffic calming is going to be updating some of the curb ramps along Corbett as, the, as that goes in. Right, right, yeah, yeah. Um, and then as part of the pedestrian bridge, as, as we were scoping that project, we included crossings of NATO and Barber. Um, so, so the access to the bridge as part of the scope of the bridge project. So they will be looking into um, what it takes to access it. Probably a new signal at Kelly, I would think, or at least some sort of uh, improved pedestrian crossing at Kelly, because that's still a very busy location. So, yep. Yep. Thank you for answering the I know I stole your uh, question. Yeah, Sorry. That's yeah. fine. Yeah. I live in the neighborhood. Right. So uh, the the surprise result of the, all the projects um, for the neighbor is is the impact of all the development on the waterfront um, and I, I think the tram is a wonderful solution for what it's doing but I think it's a small percentage of the transportation problems impacting um, my front yard and the neighborhood as a whole and I I would hope that um, you could talk about ways to get people through that and to work um, with ways other than streetcars that are you know, not sure. efficient for sure. getting to people to work quickly. Okay. Uh, so there is a, a follow-on study going on right now um, that I'm the project manager for that is looking at the, the next stages of development for South Waterfront in terms of transportation. So looking at the portal improvements that will be required, um, the uh, pedestrian bike links that need to be emphasized, the pedestrian bridge being one of them, um, but also the connections to the regional system and the, the connection between um, you know, someone who lives in South, in South Waterfront or is destined to work in South Waterfront, the system that they need to navigate in order to get there. And the pedestrian and bike are really fun to talk about, but I right. think it's still true that most people are driving Certainly. or taking buses. Right. And, and so right. I would hope that solutions connect with 
those less glamorous modes. Absolutely, right. Um, I, I think it's, it's, if it's fair to say this is probably the most complicated location in the city for uh, regional transportation. We're routing, we as a region, or we as a, a city, are routing regional trips through local area streets, through a neighborhood, um, and have done so for a very long time. Um, that's, but the fixes are incredibly expensive and incredibly complex. Every time they're looked at, um, people sort of back away to, from the, 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 you know, the, the enormous scale on which they would have to be um, put together. Um, so it's, it's a huge challenge. So part of the study is looking at um, those locations, looking at the Ross Island Bridgehead, looking at the, the use of, of Kelly and Hood to connect on to the Ross Island Bridgehead, which I think is what you're re referring to. Um, so there probably there are some um, sort of interim level improvements. So there's some new ramps that could go in that could help make some of those connections. Um, in the end, the big question becomes: Do we need direct connections between some of these regional facilities? Um, so rather than um, simply trying to squeeze them into a new route, um, do we really need direct connections between these locations? And so that's um, a question that's been addressed a couple different times. But I think that's the reoccurring theme: is what uh, on a regional scale, what's the plan to resolve these these issues? Yeah. You know, I have my own question that I'll add. We have a lot on the web. Okay. Um, but uh, related to this last discussion, what are the are there parking maximums for that are different for South Waterfront than elsewhere? Because I mean, one way you limit how many cars are going down there if they don't have anywhere to park, that's going to shift people right. somewhere else. Right. And so, what are the parking okay. standards for the area? And then it, it relates a little bit to one of the questions on the web. Is there any thought long term of actually maybe having some car free streets in that area once it really is developed? Hmm. Um, so, in terms of parking maximums, yes, that was a strong emphasis of the South Waterfront planning work. Um, I believe it's uh, two parking spaces per 1,000 square feet of commercial space. Um, so it's not quite as low as downtown, but it's um, certainly very close to that. Uh, and I think it's 1. Point, well, it's 1. 1.6 or 7 per household 1,000 square feet of household units. Um, so it is, it, there's, there's very stringent restrictions. If you talk to residents down in South Waterfront, one being here, um, they will tell you that there's not enough parking down in South Waterfront. Um, so I think, in, to a degree, the city has done a good job. If, there, if we didn't hear a complaint from both sides, you know, that, that we need more parking or that, and, you know, that we, wouldn't have, we haven't done a good enough job of, of disciplining ourselves, essentially. Um, yes, but I think that's, a, that's a, a major emphasis for the district is rest restricting the freedom of, of, of the parking, make sure there's enough to support businesses, enough to support residences, but not um, have just endless parking lots, um, which can be you know, tempting when you have that much vacant land to just use it up with, with parking facilities. Um, in terms of uh, car-free streets, there are uh, streets that do have uh, a pedestrian emphasis, um, and I can't name them offhand. Um, so those were thought of as being a, a differently designed uh, street than, than other streets. Um, and so that, as the district matures, those will start to become more apparent. Certainly from River Parkway to the Greenway, the design and the feel of all those streets change um, to be, have a more of a pedestrian emphasis. Who hasn't? You haven't asked. Yeah. yeah I, I'd always heard that the, one of the reasons for the big cost overruns for the difficulty of the top tower, and the difficulty of the top tower was largely due to the inability to tie it back into the hill. <coughs> Presumably, if the project had, uh, had come on a different schedule, uh, some conduit ways or something could have been provided in that building so that you could have passed some ties back through the building into the hill. Is right. that roughly correct? I'd say that's roughly correct. The, the greatest, like the summary challenge of why the tram was so hard to complete was all of the external pressures put on this project. Uh, typically for a, a project, if you run into barriers, you're, you, you have this choice. You either, you either extend the duration of the project to give you more time to work out a solution, um, or you increase the cost. And so uh, the choice for us again and again became, do we complete as we're committed to? So in the development agreement, the city had, had committed to OHSU and its doctors that we'd complete this project by a certain deadline. And so the, the, the uh, response was, we need to live tr true to this, this commitment. So essentially, the doctors have, um, have a mortgage already up on the hill, and they had a new mortgage at the bottom of the hill. And they had a commitment from OHSU that the city would produce this tram to be able to give them this connection. 
um, to the tune of uh, $83,000 per day was what the mortgage was going to be. So if we talk about the potential risk of not completing the project, that was a number that kept getting brought up of, of if we didn't complete the project in time, here's this looming cost of, of, that could potentially come, at, come through in some sort of lawsuit. Um, so yes, the, it was, uh, the upper station was the most challenging section of the, of the project. And it, given a different circumstance, being able to build it without all of those physical constraints would have made it a much less expensive um, solution. Yeah. More? Yep. Um, what's the life cycle of this um, infrastructure? Do we need to reinvest after like 20, 30 years? Uh, typically, they last about 50 years before needing a, a major overhaul. Um, so that's what the life cycle that we're using is a, a 50 year life cycle. Um, there are items that will need to be replaced more frequently than that. Um, so as some of the items wear, we do have a major maintenance reserve to cover the cost of the wear of those items. Um, but we're not doing a, a, a sinking fund essentially that would allow us to rebuild the whole system at the end of 50 years. So um, certainly at the end of its life cycle, there'll need to be another discussion about um, you know, rebuilding the, the system and the alignment that we have or something different at that point. That's a long ways away. Yeah. So if, assuming we can finish the project um, as we estimated in time, um, what's the revenue forecasting and when the project can reach break even? Uh, so again, it's not designed to cover its capital cost. So the capital cost was um, funded by OHSU uh, development partners down within the district and the property owners in the district as well as uh, through tax increment financing. So those are the, th the major pieces coming together. So that just covered the capital cost. The operating is not trying to pay back the capital cost. So it, it is just trying to, co to cover the cost year in, year out of running the system. Um, so there, there is no point at which it would pay back the, that capital investment. That capital investment is, is its own piece. Um, someone else who hasn't yeah. talked a little bit? Yeah. Actually, I'll uh, throw out another web question. From, oh, sure. and we have about six or so people, at least, who are watching live right. on the web and asking questions. Do I, do I know them? Uh, most of them are students, actually. Oh, okay. All right. There may be your, your co-workers may be watching. But well, they, they said they were. Yeah. If they want to email <laughs> in, they email in to uh, PSUseminar at yahoo.com. Right. Right. But uh, the question was whether there's, you know, if this one has been successful, uh, are there plans for other ones? And, uh, okay. and I'm going to say, have, have other cities or other places mm -hmm. come to you? Like they certainly have for the streetcar. What about right. for the tram? You know, uh, the locations and the instance in which a tram is the right solution is a pretty unique case. You need to have uh, very significant barriers, physical barriers, that you need to overcome. So in the mountains, that's a, a cliff band or a, you know, a, um, or a river um, that you need to fly over, and it would be very expensive to build something on the ground. Um, and so uh, in terms of additional ones here, we do have other locations that have those kind of barriers. And then also you need a degree of, of attraction so OHSU in this case, and enough feeding routes to get you between it. So it's sort of the classic transit design question. You need to have enough going on at either end to be able to make this one link work effectively. Um, in this case, all those pieces were, were there. Um, whether or not we have another example of that within Portland, we haven't started discussing, um, and probably need a little bit of time to uh, recover from this, uh, this process, um, but it could happen. Um, in terms of other cities, yes, uh, most recently uh, Winnipeg has been uh, have very active discussions. We just sent them a whole lot of information. Their city council is actively debating whether or not to connect. Um, I can't remember the name of their university there, but a university in Winnipeg with a major transit hub and, and a, like a, a regional mall of some sort. Um, so I think there's other cities that are definitely thinking about it. Um, none yet has moved you know, all the way into the point at which they've committed to do so. Yeah. Since um, that's a, uh, a topic uh, that we brought up with you, actually, right. at one of our meetings. Week, yeah. um, for people that aren't aware of it, we have um, a lot of committees within the south waterfront of the residents, and we're concerns about transportation, about bus transportation, the uh, streetcar, the tram. And as we talk, um, one of the reasons that our we feel that our maybe our retail hasn't developed uh, quite as quickly is because of parking issues. 
My personal feeling is time needs to go by a little bit farther and people realize there isn't parking, that there are choices and that the choice is going to be the streetcar. And I think, you know, 10 years from now, you will have people taking the streetcar to go to the South Waterfront to take the tram, and that would just be their way of life. I've talked to many people in the Pearl, and it's just like, I don't have a need for a car anymore except to go to the coast on the weekend or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just think it just needs time. But we're very aware that people from the outside want to come with their car, and they want to park their car and go back out to their car and leave again. But that just isn't the way it's going to be in 10 years. So I, that's just my feeling. Right. And I speak for several people down on the waterfront. Right. And yeah, that, that, that's why we live there, because we want to get rid of things. And I've talked to Hoffman Construction. They're starting to dig two more holes. Right. It will continue. And the Marabella is starting in March, which will be the assisted living. And they're encouraging them to um, bond with OHSU and Portland State to take classes, to take the streetcar, to do all these things. It's a so it's, it's just a, a different world than, you know, where you are. And uh, everybody is right now. Mm -hmm. And it's coming. Right. And you've helped us to get there. Right. Well, Almost I there. appreciate that. Yeah, I think it's, it's definitely exciting for people who are involved in the planning to meet residents and sort of hear why they moved to South Waterfront. I think that's, that's I found that, that really exciting to talk to people and understand their stories and why, why they decided that South Waterfront was the right place to match the type of life they wanted to live. So. And with that, I think, uh, oh, actually, I see two more hands. Someone who hasn't asked a question. Okay. I don't, I don't Someone, know. Yeah. okay. Um, I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about the decision against the funicular. Oh, sure. And sure. because I know that's a more common way to tackle a steep hillside issue. Right. right. Um, and was it like no easy exit or route from point A to point B or would so, be more disturbing um, to the neighbors? Often or? funiculars actually function the same as a reversible tram in that they have just a straight line alignment and they are reversible in the same way that the tram system is, so they both are in a station and then they switch back and forth. <coughs> Excuse me. So the issue with um, this location was uh, running something of somewhat even grade up through the whole um, alignment of Gibbs would have involved a whole series of structures to be able to um, pass over these different locations um, and up through this, that's the steep hillside. And so the feeling was that, that um, was just too much physical uh, infrastructure needed to make it make it viable, um, and so the amount of, of impact that that would have on on the residential streets and onto the environmental area just seemed uh, untenable. So, yeah, I, I think that there was a lot of discussion around you know whether there was another way of doing it, um, and there and there could have been. I mean, it, you know, I think that some of the the momentum was already behind the tram, so it was certainly given the the strongest consideration. Um, but it could have been, there, there might have been another way to do it. Um, and there might in the future be the need for something else to access up to OHSU. We've really only created one link between OHSU and, and South Waterfront. Certainly, um, other than the number eight bus, we could use a stronger connection between OHSU and downtown. And so what form that might take you know, is still out there. Okay, with that, and I'm sure Art will uh, answer any additional questions yes, yeah. informally afterwards, um, but I'll put in our plug first for next week. We have one of our own faculty members, Miguel Figliozzi, from the uh, Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, talking about an analysis of the efficiency of urban commercial vehicle tours. So a different topic for next week. Hope to see some of you there, and thank you very much, Art, for yeah, coming yeah. today. Okay. Oh, okay. I'm just curious, is something on Monday my coworkers were noticing? Uh, maintenance. Oh, okay. So what they, um, well, not really maintenance, a, a testing.